Mark chapter 15, the end of Jesus' life. Here we find some great and stunning truths about our God, the way that he chooses to work, the foolishness of God compared to man's wisdom. It's interesting to ponder what's going through everybody's minds in this moment. You think about this, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, they say, we're going to end this once and for all. You have Pilate, who's, I guess, rather cynical, who recognizes in many ways what is truly going on, and yet in the end, doesn't do the right thing. He, he subjects an innocent man to death, probably largely to save his own skin, his own political motivation, so on and so forth. What do you suppose the devil is thinking? Does he really think this is going to work, or is it just blind fury striking out in rage? Either way, we find out that God has greater plans than anyone of us could ever have foreseen as he makes his own son out to stand on trial, to be falsely accused, and to be, uh, to be preferred less than a murderer by the people, to be finally sentenced to an unjust, unfair death, and to give up his life on the cross. Pilate, as I said, Pilate is a rather cynical character. He understands in many ways what is going on. Notice the little note here. Pilate perceived it was out of envy that Jesus had been delivered up. And Pilate, I mean, he tries to pull some levers, but in the end, this is, again, much like Herod, it's one of the sad truths about human nature is that so often we know the right thing to do, and yet we don't, wish, we don't do it for whatever reason. Pilate, what finally dictates his actions, he wishes to satisfy the crowd as Jesus scourged ah, the pain, and then he delivers him to be crucified. The soldiers do what soldiers do. What are they thinking? They think that this is great sport. And so they put together that, that terrible crown of thorns, the crown of our king. And just think about the irony of ironies, to call him king and to real, not to realize that this is their maker, their Lord and maker, the one who rules over all things. Think about the incredible self-control and humility the true willingness to empty himself and make himself nothing that we find in our Lord Jesus as he is mocked and does not in any way, shape, or form retaliate. Then they lead him out to be crucified. They make Simon of Cyrene carry the cross. They bring him to that, that glum place, Golgotha. They offer him wine mixed with myrrh. They crucify him. They divide his garments and they put him up on the cross with two robbers. Now, stand at the foot of cross and ask yourself, at the foot of the cross and ask yourself, what is it that I see taking place there? And do it first without thinking about this from the perspective of faith. Do it first simply as if you were a passerby and observing this scene. You would probably say much the same thing that we hear people saying here. He said, oh, look at that. This man is an object of ridicule and shame. And nobody but the worst of people get put up on a cross like that. You would say here, there is only, there is only mockery. There is only shame. Here, there is only defeat. Here, the true victor of the day is going to be death. The cross has a way of bringing death, right? That's what they put people on crosses for. And so what's going to hold the field on this day is going to be death. At least that's what you see with your eyes. You see the mockery coming out. He saved others. He cannot save himself. It's only if you open up the eyes of faith that you see at the cross some remarkable things going on. That Jesus here is willingly laying down his life. No one is taking it from him. And that in so doing, he is subjecting himself, standing beneath God's righteous anger and wrath against sin. Nobody who just saw the scene with their eyes in their head realized fully that that's what's taking place here. I mean, the earth itself is darkened, right? Creation is hiding its face. There's darkness over the whole land. And, and why? Well, because God's wrath is being poured out against sin, not Jesus' own sins, but the sins of this whole world resting on his shoulders. Many of the medieval crucifixes had the cross being weighed down to signify that pressing weight on Jesus' shoulders. You open up the eyes of faith in your head and you say, wait a second, the victory here on this cross is not going to be belong to death, but actually through the death of Jesus, life 
is going to reign by willingly sacrificing his life in weakness and shame and seeming defeat, Jesus is going to bring the greatest victory of all. What an incredible way our God chooses to work. He hides himself, his grace, and his gospel behind suffering and death. He hides life behind death on the cross. And there, as Jesus gives up his life, we see not a, sh a scene of shame and defeat, but a, a scene of glory and victory for us, that Jesus would do so because he loves us so much and has us in mind. Jesus dies the sixth hour. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And th th the people there think he's calling Elijah. No, he's calling out that and having borne the true punishment for sin, not just the physical torment, but being forsaken by God so that you and I might never be forsaken by God. That's what's so wonderful and incredible about this account. They give him that nasty drink and then he utters a loud cry and breathes his last. And what happens? The curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, a sign that things are changing. The old covenant no longer is in effect. God here has made a new covenant with his people, a covenant to remember their sins no more. Here is someone at the foot of the cross who gets it, and it's surprising to us. It's a centurion. Again, if you think Mark's gospel was perhaps written for the people in Rome, it's a nice touch to remind those Roman readers that there was a centurion there at the foot of the cross who got it, who understood, and who cried out, truly he was the son of God. Then we have the, the, the sad scene of those who love Jesus standing at a distance and coming up to him and caring for him even in the, the hour of his death, coming to it says coming to, uh, they, had, they had followed Jesus and ministered him. Now they're watching out from a distance and they are going to make sure that Jesus is laid to rest. Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, together with Nicodemus, are the ones who are actually are going to take care of this. They, it says they had to take courage, obviously, and go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Pilate's surprised to hear that he's already dead. Crucifixion is not a fast track to death. In fact, people that were known to last for more than just a few days on a cross. But they did make it, the Romans typically just left people to hang and suffer and die in abs absolute agony, even for like a week or more. But they made exceptions for the Jewish concerns over dead bodies, which is why Pilate would send people out to break the legs of the other two. And they wanted to get them down so that they wouldn't be unclean before the Sabbath came. That was an exception made by the Roman Empire specifically for the Jewish people. So not surprising that, that Pilate should say, wow, he's dead already. So he does, in fact, give the body of Jesus to Joseph and the women go to make sure they see where Jesus' body is laid. And there, this sad and yet wonderful chapter ends with our, our Lord and Savior, the author of life, being laid cold and dead in a borrowed tomb. And we will have to pick it up there tomorrow for the rest of the story.